All right, we are here with Jacob from the PTP podcast. I'm super excited to have him. Jacob, you are our first ever reoccurring guest. I'm, I'm so honored. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. having me on again. <laughs> that means that you now have to come on whenever we say. So I, uh, I believe those are the rules. Yeah. Yeah. Those were laid out, <laughs> but pardon my take. They are the king of sports podcasts. What they say goes. <laughs> you are now <laughs> at our beck and call. Um, no, I'm super excited for this because we lost our Panthers person. So I have been having these Panthers questions saved up. And now I like, I was like writing it up and um, anybody who's been listening to the podcast, you know that the first half of this podcast was super, super short because nothing is happening. So I was writing this one, this doc for Jacob's interview. It is way longer. <laughs> so everything that I've been thinking about all year, we're about to solve in the next 30 to 40 minutes. <laughs> all right. I kind of want to start with just like this last season. Um, because the expectations I feel were super high for the Panthers and then they just kind of panthered. They, they very much did panther. That's a great way to put it. <laughs> so like, let's Everything just kind of went wrong whenever yeah. possible. Exactly. So like, because I am not a Panthers fan, I didn't really watch the Florida Panthers. So can you kind of like walk me through what the fuck happened down there? Uh, first of all, lucky you not having to watch the Panthers all the time. Uh, because it was a really depressing season. You get Joel Quenville to come in. You get Sergei Bobrovsky, uh, which although, yes, the person than the goalie, Sergei Bobrovsky, is much more exciting than the contract, Sergei Bobrovsky. Uh, but we can get into that in uh, in a few minutes. And you, you spend to the cap. And again, granted, spend to the cap is only good if you spend wisely. And we Yeah, didn't. you spent like, we'll talk uh, about <laughs> Matheson, but. <laughs> yeah, well, there. They, they they committed to spending to the cap way too early, and then when they missed out on Artemi Panarin, it was like, all right, what do we do with this money? And I guess the answer was Brett Connolly, Anton Strollman, and, uh, and Nola Chari, which only one of those was decent, and shockingly, it was Nola Chari. <laughs> yeah, because you hear Strollman, and you're like, well, but no, he was garbage. <laughs> See, right, Anton Strollman is exactly the kind of player we need five years ago. Yeah. 33 year old post knee surgery Anton Strawman, <laughs> not the player the Panthers needed. No, and a 33 year old knee surgery Anton Strawman is prime Chicago Blackhawks bait. Exactly. That's and you, you perfect. fell for it. So, Bobby Ryan to the Chicago Blackhawks. Let's just no, call that right. Bobby up. Ryan is coming to the Philadelphia <laughs> Flyers. Let's put that out there. Did you grow up a, Flyer, a Flyers fan? I know he's yeah, South he Jersey. Did. But, okay. We are getting the from here line of Faraby Goudreau. Ryan, despite none of them being centers. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I like Bobby Ryan could pull off center. I feel like Bobby Ryan could pull off center, but like that is the line that I need despite <laughs> knowing that it will never happen and it would never work. I just need to see it with my eyes. <laughs> That's, I totally get it. I, it's like the same thing as I want like, I want a defense pairing of Chase Prisky and Andrew Peak. I don't yeah. care how we get it. I, I just want like, them both here. We're, like, we're halfway there. <laughs> The Toronto gets to think about like the John Tavares, Mitch Marner, right. name another hockey boy line. Like, Zach Hyman. Zach Hyman. Like that's not fair. Why did they get it and I don't? Yeah, and you're welcome for Zach Hyman, another Panther screw up. Like, I'll take it. Uh, like, I just I need to see that with my lines, but <laughs> with my eyes. But anyway, the Florida Panthers. Uh, who are they? Uh, <laughs> No, so you, you spend to the cap and you bring in all these players that on paper you're like, okay, yeah. And I think even I was saying before the before last season started, on paper, this might be the most talented roster that the Panthers have ever come into a season with. There's a little asterisk on that. Well, yeah, the asterisk <laughs> is that they've never really had a very talented roster to begin with. Well, I, I mean, any roster with Yammer Yager is on it, mm, no yeah, matter that's, how, that's how old he is. But, but... okay, Yarmir Yager was counteracted by Derek McKenzie and Willie Mitchell. Like, yes. And Erica Branson. Like, let's, I will let's not, call a spade a spade. I will the teams not, that Yager was on okay. were not super talented teams. <laughs> I have become a Canucks fan. I will not stand for Erica Branson hate. <laughs> no slander. Is he on Anaheim now? <laughs> is he? I thought he who am I thinking of? I'm not a good Canucks fan. <laughs> I'm thinking Maybe of Louis Erickson. Maybe you're thinking Erickson. of like Ant I'm, oh, Louis I'm thinking Erickson. of Louis Erickson. Never mind. That, yeah, no, that makes, that's fair. There's, there's nothing wrong with Louis Erickson. He's, he's no. just another player who makes way more money than he should. Um, uh, the Vancouver Canucks. Okay. There, yeah. <laughs> Anton Roussel, Jay Beagle. The list goes on. Uh, but let's talk about the Florida Panthers. <laughs> 
I, I'm like really trying to avoid that as much as possible. <laughs> uh, no, so so you get all these players. You get maybe the best head coach of all time, at least the best one of the best head coaches currently working. I mean, Barry Trotz gives him a, gives him a run for his money, but Joel Quenville, top two, he's a top five coach in NHL history, hands yeah. down. So you get Quenville, who you're you're like okay, he can turn but he can turn Alexander Barkov into prime Jonathan Taves, right? He can turn Jonathan Huberto into like almost Patrick Kane, right? You 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 can do all these things, and then it just like didn't happen. I mean, John, prime Jonathan Taves was not good. Like, no, prime Alexander Jonathan Bar- Taves was great. It was like six months. Right, that's the thing. He had a really like short Ale- prime. Like Alexander Barkov on a bad day is as good as Jonathan Taze will ever be outside of that six-month period in 2010. <laughs> <laughs> like, let's put that out there. Yeah, no, I... But this season was a season of bad days for Alexander Barkov. So, and... Gabby, we can get into this. The okay. the whole I know before before the season we had you and Shay on. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say Shay, but that I guess it's in reference to the past, and it was before yeah. she worked for the uh, Solar Bear, so it, it counts. Um, you, we had you and Shay, and you and TJ got at each other's throats about um, the Barkov versus I Couturier was thing. Right, you were, and, and in I fairness, have... I was kind of on your side. <laughs> <laughs> like I have never been wrong once ever. <laughs> I know this and I, you know. <laughs> um, so it, it was just like it was a sea it was a season full of bad days and a bunch of like the most Panthers things that could possibly happen happened there were very few bright spots Mackenzie Weger was a tremendous bright spot kid played out of his mind mm-hmm. uh, Aaron Eckblad looks like he's returning to form he's still only like 23 years old he can definitely still be an impact player and I'm very excited to see him in the future uh, Chris Drieger coming in played 12 games to the tune of like a 930 save percentage or something. I mean, there were bright spots, but they were few and far between. And it seemed like every time the Panthers were starting to get something going, something shut it down. And I don't, I don't even mean like the Panthers, like another team shut it down. They had that, that great couple of weeks in January. uh, And then boom, all-star break. They, they get 10 days where they can't keep up that momentum. And then they had the worst February. I think they won maybe three games in the entire month of February. I mean, it was awful. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then you post trade deadline. uh, They, they come back and have a pretty good week or so. And then the season stopped. So like every time the Panthers really started to get rolling, something totally out of their control, just totally shut it down. Mm -hmm. And it was just the most infuriating thing. And the acquisition, Brett Connolly had a very good first half. He ended up with, uh, I want to say, 15 five-on-five goals. Uh, I believe he was second on the second or third on the team behind, uh, hilariously, again, Nolachari with his 19 five-on-five goals, uh, including back-to-back hat tricks. I, aside, one of my favorite stats uh, of the Panthers' entire season, he scored like, 25 percent of his goals in a three-day span you got <laughs> the back-to-back hat <laughs> tricks on his 19 <laughs> goals it, it's one of my favorite stats um and i think he finished behind alexander barkov in five on five goals too but ahead of mike hoffman which i will always tout uh because mike hoffman is not good uh yeah it's it just other than that that first kind of that first half of the season Connolly fell off and disappeared uh Anton Strawman, pure garbage in the entire season. Uh, occasionally looked okay when he was with Riley Stillman, which is really funny to me. But he, he Strawman wasn't good. But Brovsky was one of the worst goalies in the in the league. No matter how much blame you can put on the Panthers' defense, and there's a lot of it, you can put a lot of the blame on the Panthers' defense. But fact is, Bobrovsky, your goalie is supposed to bail out your defense when they make mistakes, and Bobrovsky was unable to bail out the Panthers like ever. Uh, Nolachari was the most consistent piece. You get Nolachari to play 4C, I think he finished the season as the top line right wing. <laughs> but like, other than that, the acquisitions were crap. Uh, the, the season was disappointing at every turn. Joel Quenville uh, didn't fix the problems that Bob Bugner brought on. 
granted, he had one shortened season, so I'm not like saying, oh, it's time for Joel Quenville to go, but it's 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 bleak, it, and it was a very very disappointing and depressing season for the Panthers. I mean, especially when you look at the what the other top coaches in the leagues have done, and like not to toot my own horn, but like Alain Vigneault turned around the Flyers very quickly. Right. Barry Trotz did it with the Islanders. He's Barry these- Trotz is a friggin' miracle worker. <laughs> miracle worker. So like, it like it's got to be disappointing when you get like the guy that everybody wanted, and the guys that got passed up don't do like do better. Right. The Bobrovsky thing, I feel really bad because I saw this coming. Because oh, you're a Flyers fan. I'm a Flyers fan, and I know <laughs> goalies, and I know bad goalies, and I know goalies who can't play behind bad defenses. And the reason Bob Rossi did so well in Columbus is because because Columbus's defense is so good. And I hate See, Seth Jones, and I hate Zach Wierenski. Mm-hmm. I hate them, but they're way better than like league average defensemen. And I, I feel like the Florida Panthers are exactly league average defensemen, maybe below generous they have two good defensemen of their six um i i need to look at the uh the 2012 13 blue jackets roster um because like a lot of a lot of twitter especially was making that same claim that like oh yeah this just goes to show how much like how good columbus's defense is and how great uh john tortorello was uh at managing them Columbus's defenseman in the 12-13 season, uh, and this is a year uh, in which Sergei Borovsky won the Vezina. Uh, Jack Johnson was uh, Jack Johnson and Fedor Tutin uh, played the most games. Uh, and again, this was the shortened uh, the shortened season, lockout shortened season. Uh, their defense was Jack Johnson, uh, Fedor Tutin, James Wisniewski, Adrian Okwa, Tim Erickson. Like Nikita Nikita and Dalton Prout, these these are not good defensemen. Yeah, but Bobrovsky was also like twenty four. Right. <laughs> like, there's a very big difference in between twenty four four year old Sergei Bobrovsky and thirty three year old Sergei Bobrovsky. Right, and I. That was how they tricked the Flyers because it was RJ Umberger, <laughs> Jake Voracek, and him. And I love Jake Voracek. Or Jake Voracek was sooner because that was the Sean Couturier trade. But that's how they tricked RJ Umberger. And Sergey Bobrovsky, what the fuck? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I yeah, hate I, I did, like Bobrovsky has been good behind bad defenses before. Yeah, though. but like, that's the age, and I think the right. contract. At thirty years old, he's not going to be. Yeah. And that mm-hmm. only six six years left at ten million dollars. Hooray! Don't pay goalies. I cannot wait. As somebody whose like goalie situation is like set up. I cannot wait for this summer to watch every old goalie just make carry price money forever. And it's like, you're all going to suck. And when Carter Hart comes to that age, I know he's going to make carry price money, but I'm hoping he has like three cups by then. So I don't care. <laughs> well, you, you say that. And I, I don't want to belittle Carter Hart. I really like him and I wish him the best for his career. These are about Matt to be Murray won words. two Stanley Cups as a rookie and ask Penguins fans how they feel about him now. Uh, Penguins fans are dicks. So, That's fair. Very I, fair. I literally on my round table, which you guys have already heard, Megan, you have to act surprised tomorrow. My <laughs> round table is literally about different types of rivalries and how I hate the entire city of Pittsburgh just out of like pure spite. Which is why you now love Patrick Hornquist. <laughs> yes. Petty King. Let's let's skip to that. That's later, but like let's just skip to that. Um, it, it came up naturally. It came up naturally. So we talked about what the penguins are doing earlier we got to talk about the florida panthers side of this trade which we are saving for you um i mean patty horn this is great for you patty hornquist is not like the pen that you want but he's way better than colton skeever and mike or mike matheson yeah Yeah. emily matheson's husband if you know anything about my brand jared mccann is the pan is the penguin that i wanted um you can't have him back (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I want him back and Jim Rutherford is clearly keep... an idiot who's willing to do anything for anyone you did not keep the receipts <laughs> Jim Rutherford or Kyle Dubas keeps his receipts he can return <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah I getting Mike Matheson off the books Bill Zito has been the GM of the Florida Panthers for mm, a month he's already one of the best GMs in Florida Panthers history 
so this just is for getting Mike Matheson off the books without this, any amount of salary retention. Okay, this is really the thing that like was next in the list. Well, firing Adele Thomas, but we'll get back to that. <laughs> Bill Zito was the guy that I wanted for Philadelphia. So when you guys got him, I don't hate the Panthers. I have a soft spot for the Panthers because of the ghost. I was so excited for you guys. Then he hired the Minnesota Wild front office, and I was like, what you doing, Bill? Yeah. But I, this being his first move, you got to be excited. Yeah. As far as, like, office personnel, I'm really iffy on his decision so far. But as far as roster construction goes, he's batting a 1,000 easy. Granted, this, it's a sample size of one move. Yeah. <laughs> but it is one fantastic move. And I don't think Bill Zito is ever going to be the guy to, to get you the superstar, which – I have a question about that later on, um, but I think that Bill Zito is going to get you all the right pieces to build around the superstars that you have because you have them. The problem is that they're not being utilized. Mm -hmm. So like, like Alexander Barkov should be winning Selkies when Sean Couturier is not. Like he, like Sean Couturier won, Barkov too. They, <laughs> Barkov and Couturier should be trading the Selkie back and forth like Bergeron and Taves. Could, like, <laughs> like Bergeron, Taves, Kopitar. Like, yeah, that should and be... Ryan, I guess we have to throw Ryan Getzloff in there for fairness, but... No, we don't have to do anything <laughs> for Ryan Getzloff. Well, okay, but there can also be an Anthony Sorelli angle here. Yeah, so. <laughs> but like you, you have the right stars and now it's about building around them. And I think Bill Zito is going to be that guy because Bill Zito loves his team he re okay so the reason philadelphia wants him is because he just reminds us of a philadelphia sports guy yeah. no matter what team is on he is going to die for that team and i think that's the kind of gm that you want talking to players who want to like move on like they're he's never going to convince like uh who are the big free non-goalie free agents this year Alex um, Petrangelo, uh, like he's taylor never going to convince taylor hall to come and play for him. taylor hall He's never going to convince – well, he might convince Taylor Hall to play for the Florida Panthers. I kind of hope not. <laughs> but, like, but, like, he's never going to convince Alex Petrangelo to come play for the Florida Panthers. But what he's going to do is he's going to make Patrick Hornquist hate the fucking Penguins and waive his no-trade contract – or no waive. His no-trade no clause. <laughs> no-trade clause, thank you. It was a full no-trade no clause that becomes a modified no-trade cla no clause next year. Yeah, he's going to talk – Hornquist up he's going to talk about the Panthers so well that he's going to get horny to to waive his no movement clause and come to the Florida Panthers I like the just the little snippet of he Bill Zito is going to get horny yeah, yeah. um <laughs> dangerously horny <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to describe Patrick Hornquist though yeah um though for what and it's worth if I had my way the next move would be to flip Pat Hornquist for a draft pick or a prospect <laughs> I, I think you want to really clear that space. My my view of the Panthers has turned very pessimistic really quickly. Um, whereas before last season, I was thinking, oh, this is the best roster we've ever had. This is great. We're, as long as Sergei Bobrovsky is Sergei Bobrovsky, we're going to be great. The problem uh, is that he was Sergei Bobrovsky. <laughs> he was just 33-year-old Sergei that's, Bobrovsky. That's, yeah. <laughs> uh, but now on the flip side of that, I'm like, all right, this team has clearly shown that it is not good enough to go anywhere yet. Uh, and I don't think it's a one off season fix. Um, so maybe Pat Hornquist, 33 year old, he'll be 34 before the season starts. Uh, so maybe with the three years left on his contract, you get one good year out of him. Uh, he, he is a very, very rough uh, injury history, lots of concussions. Uh, he's not going to be the player that he was when the Penguins were won the back-to-back -back Cups. I mean, that was a couple, what, four or five years or three or four years ago at this point? Four or five? Time is a joke. Um, he, he's, he's still one of the best net front guys in the league. It's like Hornquist and Pavelski. Like, they are the guys who can bother the hell out of a goalie and tip the puck into the net. Uh, or just screen the hell out of the goalie. Like, that's still helpful. And Pat Hornquist does bring a lot of things uh, to the Panthers that they need. They need someone to be that guy. They need, Like, I hate what I'm about to say. They need someone to be the tough guy. Yeah. It has to be someone who can also contribute. That That's, let me. <laughs> yeah, like Mike Matheson. They need a bully. They, they yeah. need, I, and I, again, hate what I'm about to say. They need a Tom Wilson. Like, that's, that's okay. what the Panthers need. Low-key, 
everybody needs a Tom Wilson. Right. Everyone <laughs> right. needs a Tom Wilson. He's a jerk. He's yeah. an ass. Now that he's no longer he getting makes, suspended. He makes it right. Like, yeah. take the dirty plays out of Tom Wilson. He's actually a really good player. Top uh, line if Tom. You, if you optimize Tom Wilson, it's Brad Marchand. And again, I hate they're that I'm very, saying that. They're different. Mm-hmm. They're, they're different kinds of assholes, but they're both assholes. <laughs> No, even their playing style is very different. Like, Brad Marchand is never going to be able to bully people. He's going to be a pest. Like, I, when I think of Brad Marchand, I think of Travis Konechny, where it's like they're just going to annoy the shit out of you. Tom mm-hmm. Wilson is going to physically That's bully true. you. The problem, like, the Tom Wilson comparison. Brad Marchand will get, someone, uh, will get someone to bully him and then have Zidane Ochara pick up the scraps. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. The, like the, flip, the other side of the coin with Tom Wilson is uh, Matt Martin. And, yeah. Like, you you don't like Matt Martin's nice for the Islanders because they have Casey Zizekas and Cal Clutterbuck and they have right. that line, but Matt Martin on himself, like we saw with the Toronto Maple Leafs, is not an asset. Right. Tom Wilson is an asset. Right. Mm-hmm. And they told Tom Wilson stop being Matt Martin, start being Tom Wilson. And right. then it just everyone like, needs a Tom Wilson. Everyone does not need an Eric Branson. That's yeah. Like that's that's where I'm coming from here. And Pat Hornquist is somewhere in between right now. Yeah. Pat uh, Hornquist is going to be a fantastic role player. Right. He'll he'll be that bottom six guy. Uh, well, with the way the Panthers roster is constructed, he might sneak into the second line uh, and probably power play too. If I'm being honest, he'll be net front power play, yeah. which could help because the Panthers need help there too. Uh, their top power play is golden. Well, without Mike Hoffman, we'll see what happens. But because that's the one place where he isn't terrible. Um I have lots of bad things to say about Mike Hoffman. I'm not a fan. Go to their Carlson. Uh, you're fine. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the thing about Hornquist, again, like he's making $5.3 million against the cap for the next three seasons. The Panthers are not going to be good as a team for the first of those three seasons. And that's really the only time that I think Hornquist is going to provide any on ice value. Uh, so uh, if I had my way, I'm calling like Nashville and Vancouver and maybe even Dallas and saying like, hey, do you want Pat Hornquist? We'll take X prospect or a third or second round draft pick. Mm-hmm. And I, I, the Panthers need to build up their draft stock and figure out how to be good for themselves without having to like go out and sign Anton Strawman and Brett Connolly again. Well, that's where Bill Zito is such a right. big pickup because – he built he's the one who picked Seth Jones, Zach Wierenski, PLD. Like and that's when he hired the Minnesota guys, that's what kind of worried me because you don't think of Minnesota as a drafting Paul team. Sucks at drafting. Exactly. But Bill Zito was so good at it that he can take control of that and be like, I'm gonna be the draft guy. I'm not big on acquisitions, and that's where Paul Fenton like thrives, like on the signing guys, because like he convinces people to play for the Minnesota Wild. Like <laughs> right. like like, so, all right. One of the things that I have on here is like last week we had Lissa Hood from uh, Jet Centric on, and we were talking about Winnipeg and how the physicality of being in Winnipeg is a detriment to their signing pro, like mm-hmm. their signing process. How is the advantage of being in Miami not been utilized correctly in Florida? Like, I feel because like it, the team isn't good, and also the team isn't in Miami. It's like the, thirty minutes. The team plays in Sunrise, which for those of you unfamiliar is about 10 to 15 minutes due west of fort lauderdale uh it literally the stadium literally if you go any further west from the bbnt center you're in the everglades it's literally swampland uh granted there are players who live like sergey Bobrovsky lives in miami yeah most of the players most of the younger players who don't have like wives and families live in downtown fort lauderdale there's still like it's still playing it's still hockey in paradise yeah. Uh, if you want to use that that mantra, um, but that is only a good selling point uh, to a certain extent. I, I don't want players who just want to come here to live the Miami lifestyle. That could be a detriment to actually playing good hockey. <laughs> the Miami yeah, lifestyle like- is partying and being on the beach and cocaine and like all this other stuff i mean they're doing that in minnesota anyway that well in minnesota you have to do that to like like, not drive yourself crazy every hockey player is doing a shit ton of cocaine (laughs) that's very fair (laughs) like so do it where there's the good stuff (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, like, like Miami cocaine is way better than Toronto cocaine. That's, you know what? I wouldn't know from experience, but. Um. Neither would I. I just <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't have picked Toronto. Like Toronto's a major city. Fine. It's better than Ottawa cocaine. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> like. Um, but so I, I think they do try to use the, the Miami lifestyle as a selling point, but it only goes so far when the team can't win and the team can't make them. This is a team that hasn't won a playoff round since a lot of its fan base has been alive. Yeah. If you're 25 years old or younger, you've never seen the Panthers win a playoff round. Oh. They, they haven't won a round since 96 when they made that miraculous run to get swept by the avalanche in the cup. That's unfortunate. <laughs> it's awful. The life of a Panthers fan is stress, trauma, and disappointment. Like that's just, that's what it is. Um, they've only made the playoffs, uh, I think four times in their history, 96, 97, uh, 2012, and 2016. Technically 2020. <laughs> I don't count that as a playoffs. It, it was a play in round and they lost to the Islanders. The, it, it was the post season. If you want to get really technical, <laughs> but no, it like it's, it's really hard to convince top talent to come play for you when you can't win at all. Yeah. So, okay. There's like two parts of the next question. Like, I want to talk about the next step, but before we can go forward, we have to go back. The firing of Dale Talon. One, how did it take so long? Two, I understand COVID, but like, how is there not a celebration in the streets? COVID is why there's no celebration in the streets. Um, That's like your Stanley Cup parade. It's like the firing of Dale It Talon. really is. Like, Dale Talon got fired, throw the parade. Like, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the best thing the Panthers could have possibly done. Um, I don't want to make more work for you, Gabby, as the person who edits. I do know the real answer to why did it take so long. I can't publicly say the real answer to why did it take so long. We'll talk about it after we stop. Yeah, <laughs> it has to do with ownership, though, and their their relationship. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I I yeah. do actually know secondhand the real reason why it took so long, but I can't say it publicly. Okay. Um, I, I think it just, it took so long to get rid of Dale Talon because like he was just the easy guy to go back to after that whole like Tom Rowe tragedy, that Tom Rowe tragedy. I actually think that off season is one of the better ones that the Panthers have ever had. Um, <laughs> second only to this one in which we've only seen the Mike Matheson trade as the off season, but that's still a fantastic off season already. Um, but like the the Tom Rowe computer boys off season was trading Eric Branson for Jared McCann, getting rid of Dmitry Kulikov and bringing in Mark Pesic, signing Jonathan Marcheseau, like getting Jason Demers. Like it was a great off season. Not every move was like perfect. Signing Keith Yandel to six million or six years at six point three million dollars to come in and be a power play specialist isn't ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, but they hit a lot more than they missed. And they hit a lot more than people give him credit for. It was only once Tom Rowe took over as coach that things started kind of snowballing into disaster. Um, and let's also not forget that that was uh, like that was a rough. Uh, never mind. I think there was a season after that. Jonathan Huberto had his had his Achilles cut before the season started. Um, so it, 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 it was only once Tom Rowe took over as coach that things started snowballing into disaster. And Tom Rowe's awful coaching style is what made ownership kind of think like, hey, maybe this isn't working and blamed the, the computer boys who only had six months to actually do anything. Uh, and at the end of that season, you quote unquote fire Tom Rowe, who was actually technically kept on as a senior advisor, but kind of hidden away in a cave somewhere and no one ever heard his name again. Hockey works. Right. Uh, and Dale Talon was brought back because analytics were viewed as the enemy and why, why the Panthers became a problem that year. Trusted hockey man, work. Dale Talon. Exactly. Like that's why it took so long. Cause the one, the one off season that, they kind of tried to modernize didn't result in immediate success and Dale Talon was still involved in the organization 
So it was so easy to just plug him back into that GM role. Yeah. I mean, and then there just wasn't really, they should have fired him in, they should have fired him after the 2010 draft. Like he shouldn't have even gotten a season, but that's a different story. There were so many opportunities to get rid of Dale Talon that would have been justified. The fact that it took 10 years to finally like totally remove him from the organization is pathetic. And that's through two ownership groups too. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I don't think of Bill Zito as like in the, the Minnesota wild group as like modern hockey guys. Oh, they're not. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, I mean, every time I look at Bill Zito, I just think of every guy who's ever been on the news about the Philadelphia Eagles. Like that's just what I see in my head. Like, I know that's not him, but it is him. Like he's got a dog mask in his like closet. Um, <laughs> But I just like, like, that's who he is. So, but I mean, I think their old school, I approach kind of works. So like, don't knock it. Like, I think, I think if you're going to go computer boy style, you have to buy in. And the Florida Panthers have shown that they're never going to buy into that again, because like, it didn't work for six months. So if you're going to go old school approach, you got to hire the right people. And Bill Zito and that group are the right people for that. Right. Um, and- I don't think Bill Zito is a total scorner. That's not a word, but I'm going to, I'm going to stick with it. He's not a, he doesn't like scorn analytics and data. Um, we, no, we, had, not uh, comfortable with. we had Allison Lucan on our, on point to point a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and she mentioned that like he spoke at a, at a, at a CBJ hockey analytics conference panel on, on analytics. Like he, he's, I don't think the data is his favorite part of his job, Yeah, but he doesn't totally ignore it either, which is yeah. nice. Like, I think, so like, obviously I don't know him, but I think <laughs> like the numbers are not for everybody. I don't totally understand them. Megan gets them way more than me, but like, I think you use them to kind of make sure that what you're seeing is correct. Right. Mm-hmm. And I like, that is the good way to do it. You don't want to rely too heavily on the numbers because like, science is difficult and math like skew stuff like we see that all the time um and you don't want to purely rely on the eye test because there is a bias there yeah. so if you can make sure that what you're seeing is actually true it's helpful and i think that's kind of that's what you want from your hockey guys like right I, like i i love the computer boys i trust them more than the old school hockey eye test guys but i think that marriage is what makes a hockey team work because you want the people who know what they're looking at. Right. And I mean, like, obviously, like, it's to a lesser extent, but, like, I know when a player is good or bad. Like, and I, like, sometimes I get confused when I look at the numbers, and I'm like, this is not showing me what I, like, what I'm looking at. So, like, it's very, like, you want to have that eye test and somebody to double check their work. And right. I think Bill Zito is the right guy for that. I had a point earlier about Patrick Hornquist, and I forgot about it. Patrick <laughs> Hornquist is going to be like Wayne Simmons. Okay. And that's not That's a good a, comparison. I forgot about Wayne Simmons. Like he just kind well, of isn't Buffalo relevant now. anymore, but He's in, he's in Buffalo now. That's easy to forget. He was on the New Jersey Devils and then he went to yeah. Buffalo. <laughs> I, like, I remember him being a part of the Devils. And... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like I think of Wayne Simmons in his last year where you're like I like you're not doing much for me, but what you do is super helpful. So thank you and also you're Wayne Simmons and I love you and you raised me. And I think that's part of it like Patrick Hornquist didn't raise you guys like he raised Flyers fans, right. but Patrick Hornquist got rid of Mike Matheson. So there's going to be a little bit of that that you're like, oh, I want to love you so bad that you're so frustrating. But like sometimes you do really good things. And also he makes $5.3 million against the cap to probably be a bottom six forward. <laughs> bottom six forwards are not the worst. Okay. No, but they shouldn't be making $5 million. <laughs> Yeah, Especially like, not at 33 years old, 34 years Nathan old. Nathan McKinnon makes like five million dollars. I I had a realization uh, yesterday that like, because someone someone on my Twitter made a point that like, oh, if 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 he makes uh, if he makes our star players worth their cap hits, then he'll be worth his. And I was like, uh, it, it like hit me all at once. Like Barkov and Huberdo make half a million dollars more than Patrick Hornquist. Yeah. Like, are you really going to sit here and tell me that Jonathan Huberdo? and Alexander Barkov, both of whom paced for like 100-point seasons, aren't worth $5.9 million, but Patrick Hornquist is worth his 5.3? Like, are you kidding me? Hold on. Nathan McKinnon. McKinnon is making six, six, million, six million bucks flat. Uh, yeah. Okay, hold on. Sean Couturier is on a really good contract, too. 
Shay Theodore. I, <laughs> when Shay Theodore wins his Norris, making less than six million dollars a year, like that's the best contract in the league. So, Patrick Hornquist makes 0.8 million dollars more a year than Sean Couturier. And Sean Couturier just very deservedly won the Selkie. Like, <laughs> oh my God. I hate hockey. It's so stupid. Right. Like, I don't dislike Patrick Hornquist as a player. I think he brings a lot of things that the Panthers need, just not at that cap hit, which is why I would love to flip him. Yeah, I mean, Panthers Patrick Hornquist... set up for their next window because this one is closed. Patrick Hornquist got a two-cup bonus. <laughs> like... Right. That's what the Panthers paid him for. Right. So, or not the Panthers, the, the Penguins pa- paid the Penguins. him for. <laughs> it's what um, the Panthers paid for now. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that better in leadership? <laughs> right. But you're right. The fact that Patrick Hornquist is the manifestation of not Mike Matheson. Yeah. Is going to endear him to a lot of Panthers fans. Can I tell <laughs> he makes you more what... money than Matheson? Like the cap hit is higher, but the fact that three years from now we'll be totally free of that cap hit and the and Penguins not will Mike, Matheson. Pay Mike Matheson four point eight million dollars. <laughs> like, yeah. have fun with that, Pittsburgh. Um, you also gave like them Mike Colton Skeever, so it actually came months. out. You also gave them Colton Skeever, so it came out like about even. But Sevier, for this season, the Panthers come out ahead in cap space. Sevier has one season left on his contract. Mm-hmm. Um, so the two seasons after this coming season, the Panthers are on the hook for about half a uh, half a million more. Uh, yeah, but then, but once then the, seasons are the up, three seasons following <laughs> yeah. is when the Panthers are golden. Mm-hmm. But um, I, my personal preference is get rid of the cap hit entirely as soon as you can. So if you can flip Hornquist while he still has value, yeah. maybe the play here is like what is, set, what him, is up as, set him up as power play one and power play two. Yeah, Ottawa, Ottawa, Ottawa needs to hit that cap floor. So Ottawa, <laughs> Ottawa, well, Ottawa also shouldn't be getting rid of futures right now. True. So while they do need to, they do need to hit the cap floor. You're not going to get much, much value uh, out of them for three, four, five years down the line. Let me look um, at something. May, maybe the play with Hornquist, honestly, is to set him up with more ice time than he deserves and set him up with some power play time, try to really sealing his value, and then flip him at the deadline. Thoughts on flipping uh, Hornquist for Artem and Isimov for one year. It's 4.5, and then you're done. I'd do that. Panthers need a center. Yeah. I, mean, I if if that was not, but and then like you do that in like a second in three years. Right. Like I, I, I would I would trade Hornquist for Anisimov. Anisimov yeah. might be terrible, but it's a center. <laughs> um The Panthers will... are in desperate need of NHL level centers, and there is an argument to be made that Artem Anisimov is no longer an NHL level center. But, but that's an AHL level center, which is better than an AHL level center. So like whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you what endeared Patrick Hornquist to me. Because this is the thing that brought up my point about yep. <laughs> is him just being like, fuck the penguins. Here's all of my shit. I'm going to run it over with my car. Actually, I'm not here. I'm in Sweden. I'm going to have somebody else run it over with their car and then leave it in Pittsburgh. Fuck the Schittsburg team. Yeah, that was fantastic to see. Like, I, I love that attitude of like, all right, this team's done with me. Fine. I'm done with them. Like, that's, <laughs> I'm going to Florida. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, I'm going to do that good cocaine <laughs> and not have to listen to Cindy Crosby. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Sidney Crosby is like tells the worst stories in the locker room and because he's Sidney Crosby, everybody has to laugh? Like, those no, the- I actually I think he tells great stories. I just don't think he's good at telling them. Like, that's that's the vibe I get from Sidney Crosby. He has great stories to tell, yeah. he just doesn't tell them in an exciting way. See, I think Sidney Crosby like goes home at night and plugs into a wall and just like boom. <laughs> Like, I don't think there's, like, anything, like, we talk about head empty, no thoughts when it comes to, like, Jamie Benn, Kevin Hayes, Travis Konechny, but I think that Sidney Crosby, it's, like, elevator music, but then it's, like, boop, time to die. Like, you know an iRobot when, like, everything, like, wakes up? Yeah. That, that's Sidney Crosby. <laughs> like, I, the I, eyes go red and you're, like, oh, shit. The, the, the uh, addendum that I'll make to my to my take on Crosby is most of his good stories are about hockey. 
Yeah. He, he has great hockey stories to tell. He just doesn't tell them excitingly. Like, do you think when Sidney Crosby recounts the golden goal that it's, that it's in an exciting way? I, like, I feel like not. He's no. not an exciting person. He's a very exciting player. Yeah. <laughs> but he just doesn't seem like an exciting human. Or like, you know, those people who like, all of their all of their like life stories are like my one friend my one friend and it's always the same person just like all of his life stories are actually about nathan mckinnon (laughs) (laughs) there's definitely i there there definitely feels like that older brother younger brother relationship between the two cole harbor nova scotia natives (laughs) yeah we talked about that with aj uh hayfully from dnvr and he's like it's not very much older brother younger brother in like the competitiveness yeah it's more like like friends yeah. but there is like an older brother younger brotherness in the like style that like nathan mckinnon is very much trying to be a leader like Sidney crosby except his personality doesn't allow for it because he cares like not that Sidney crosby doesn't care but like nathan <laughs> mckinnon cares violently in a way that Sidney yeah. crosby doesn't like Sidney crosby is like i know that people are going to work up to me and nathan mckinnon is like i'm a child and i need to make sure people respect me and he doesn't have that name power because coming from the same town as Cindy Crosby he always got called called mini Cindy Crosby like if Nathan McKinnon came from anywhere else there wouldn't be a discussion about Nathan McKinnon being better than Cindy Crosby it would just be knowledge yeah. like the fact that because he also comes from Cole Harbor he's never going to be respected like that like if he came from any other city in Canada the conversation would be Connor McDavid or Nathan McKinnon it would not be Connor McDavid or Cindy Crosby I, I haven't heard people mention Sidney Crosby at that echelon anymore. Well, I mean, in a little while, but well, yeah, maybe, maybe because you're Connor in Pennsylvania. McDavid, well, no, it's because Connor McDavid is proven to be that good, and that he's That's way true. like if if Sidney Crosby was younger, it would be a different conversation. Mm-hmm. But, oh yeah, but like I think Nathan McKinnon doesn't get put in that conversation versus Connor McDavid because everybody ruled him out because they just see him as mini Sidney Crosby, and he will never. Like, the media, I think, makes the big brother, little brother thing way more than Sidney Crosby and Nathan McKinnon do. And that's kind of what AJ Hastily said, that, like, mm-hmm. the media plays it up way more than they do. Okay. Yeah, that and, makes sense. And, like, they they put Nathan McKinnon in this little brother role that he will never get the respect in this league that he deserves. Mm-hmm. And, like, he gets a lot of freaking respect. He was, like, nominated for, like, six awards that he probably, like, he should He should have won at least one of them. He should have won the heart. Probably really should have won the like, Lindsay. He should not have won the Lindsay. Dry for not have won the freaking heart. Mm. If you have two heart nominees on your team, you have no heart nominees on your team. Straight up. No, you do. It's just Connor McDavid is the It's answer. Connor McDavid. Like but, <laughs> yeah. but like Connor McDavid was. None of Connor team. McDavid's teammates should ever win the heart trophy. <laughs> yeah. But like what the the argument that Oilers fans were making with me was Connor McDavid was hurt for two weeks and. And then later in the season, Leon Dreisaitl scored 10 points in, like, one week. And they're like, so there. And I'm like, Connor McDavid had eight assists in that 10 point. Like, Connor McDavid <laughs> had eight points. <laughs> Although I will, I, I will give Dreisaitl credit for just his, like, offensive production. I did look at his scoring report um, a couple of weeks ago. And a lot fewer uh, McDavid connections than I would but, have But, like, expected. when the best players on the other team – are fighting McDavid, That's you're true. getting the third line That's and you're true. Leon Dreisaitl. <laughs> like, like I'm not, Leon Dreisaitl is a fantastic player. He's probably a top 10 player in the league. Mm. He is number two on his team. And he does not play with Connor McDavid because they think that they're both centers. Right. So it's like, mm. <laughs> okay. I think Artemi Panarin should have won the heart, to be honest. I mean, Artemi Panarin, Problem. Artemi Panarin dragged but, the Rangers kicking and screaming mm-hmm. into the playoffs. Like Zibanejad helped, but then he play also in. got hurt. Play in, asterisk. Play in. Um, <laughs> absolutely, but like their whole thing is like you have to make the playoffs. Like I don't think Artemi Panarin would have even been in the conversation if it hadn't been for the COVID stock season. Oh, I um because of the playoffs. Um, I disagree. Every so often, you get the you get that little third place vote. No, I think uh, Ryan O'Reilly would have been there instead. Hmm. I don't know. Just because, just because it's like name one player in the West, uh, Ryan O'Reilly. <laughs> but Drysaddle's already there. And Nathan McKinnon. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this year is a very weird year of name one player in the East, and the answer is Artemi Panarin. The answer is Artemi. No, Jack Eichel. 
Jack Eichel. Fuck Jack yeah. Eichel. Jack Eichel always. Poor should man's win. Alexander Barkov. <laughs> Jack Eichel should always win the Hart Trophy. Nobody is. Uh, it's Connor McDavid and then Jack Eichel because nobody is more valuable to their team than those two guys. Right. I, I do hate the wording of the Hart Trophy. Absolutely. Because the, the most valuable to your team. Like, like the, Leon Dreisaitl. The, the deserved, best player on the worst team should then win the Hart. Like, yeah. that's. <laughs> like, Leon Dreisaitl deserved the Lindsay Trophy. Leon Dreisaitl was the best player in the league this year. The Art Ross, absolutely, because that's. He deserved just, the Art Ross because that's a math award. Yeah, like, but like. But he like, didn't. He wasn't the most outstanding player. He should win the Ted Lindsay less frequently than he wins the Hart. He's never more outstanding than Connor McDavid. Well, this year he, I mean, just the 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 ten the ten points in like four games. <laughs> I mean, I, all right, I, closet Oilers fan. No, I was very much wanted Nathan McKinnon to win the Lindsay. It helped my argument with the Kill McCarr Quinn Hughes thing. If Nathan McKinnon won the Lindsay and the Hart, um, but we'll we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, but I just like I I forgot my point. I got distracted by Kill McCarr Quinn Hughes. I said Quinn Hughes, and my friend was like, "Whoop." Kelvin Car Quinn Hughes, because you are also a Quinn Hughes person. I am. That hurt my heart. I knew it was coming too. Like there are like weird props, prop bets you can make in the NHL. Like I can't bet. I don't bet. But if I was a betting person, I wouldn't be able to bet NHL games because so many things are up in the air. But I think the long-term props I would actually be good at because I think I think well like that. And like I said at the beginning of the year, Quinn Hughes will score more points than Kale McCarr, but Kale McCarr will win the Calder Trophy. When it was, when Jack, when Jack Hughes oh, was out of it. what a good bet that would have been. Jack, when, once Jack Hughes was out of it, I knew that was coming. Because beyond the number one pick, they are, the NHL is never going to pick the small Jewish boy over, <laughs> the, over the blonde. And it's outrageous to say, <laughs> but like, it's true. They have their. You who's... should. Uh, you should look up the Weisblatt family, Gabby. I did. I. You did. Okay. Good. <laughs> Isn't it a beautiful story? It's such a great story. For people who don't know, the Weisblatts are three brothers. I think four, but only four? one of uh, one of them probably is never going to make the NHL. The other three might. They're, they're like the stalls. So the so it's four brothers, hockey brothers, who are good. They're very good. Their mom is a single deaf mother who is raising three and a half boys to go into the NHL. <laughs> I just like, I'm like watching the videos and reading the articles and I'm like, Ugh! because like the Hughes are like a Royal family when it comes to hockey. Yeah. And so it's like, it's different. Like, yeah, they're Jewish, but like, like they're white. <laughs> like, yeah. Like Weinberg Hughes, like they're fine. The wise lads, <laughs> like all oh, babies, all oh, babies. We, um, we, we had a, we just put out our episode with Reese Jessup and he's like, that's where we learned about the Weisblatts. And he said the name Ozzy Weisblatt and immediately that switch, that switch clicked in my head. And I was like, Jew, like immediately <laughs> I, I tabbed off to look him up. That, yeah. like, Ozzy Weisblatt Jewish was the next thing I did after he said that name and I nailed yeah. it. And it's such yeah. a beautiful story. Like I just, uh, that's, I'm like trying to think of shirts, like Jews for Hughes, just like pops. Wise Blatt's harder to come up with a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the the Wise Blatt brothers' names, the way that the the mother picked the names was, uh, since she doesn't know what the names sound like, she wanted to pick names that looked pretty and reminded her of the ocean. <gasps> oh my goodness! What if I I know Ozzy? Uh, Ozzy Ocean, like one of them is named Ocean. Oh my god, uh, he's so cool! Ocean Wise Blatt, Oasis Wise Blatt, and Orca Wise Blatt. I love them so much. Right? Like, <laughs> it goes Quentin. Like, move Jerome. over, Hughes brothers. It's <laughs> well, no, Quentin Jerome Hughes is my baby. All four Wise Blats, Luke, <laughs> Jacob Chicker, and Jason Demers, every other Jewish player, Jack Hughes. Actually, Jack Hughes grew a mullet, so he's like moving up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> when Jack. Also, Hughes Jonathan was... Marcheseau is Jewish adjacent. His girlfriend is Jewish, and okay. their child is, ra- is being raised Jewish. Okay. You went to like, a Jewish that's like Nate Thompson. Boca Raton. Nate Thompson is like converted for his wife. So I'm like, Nate Thompson's Aww. cool. That's everybody's hating on him because he sucked in the playoffs. I'm like, you leave Nate Thompson alone. We hate on Derek Grant here. <laughs> <laughs> Nate Thompson kills penalties and is Jewish. We're in. <laughs> that's like, I realized over 
the playoffs that like there's something like really sexy about effectively penalty killing. Oh, abs- why do you think I love Alexander Barkov so much when he's actually on his game? Like that's like the thing that put me back on my Tyler saying and bullshit wasn't his, like his wokeness like woke me up. But it, when I found out that he penalty killed now, I was like, oh, <laughs> we're here. We're here to stay. But Tyler, is he good at it? <laughs> yes. I mean, as much as the stars are. That's fair. <laughs> like they were good until they had to face the Tampa Bay Lightning. And then it's like, oh. Well, story of most teams <laughs> in the NHL's lives. Yeah. So I'm like, oh shit. Like Tyler Sagan is now woke and he can penalty kill. Like Tyler Sagan's credit. He does have a, a positive impact on his expected shorthanded defense. Good for him. Like the perfect man doesn't exist, but Tyler Sagan is out there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we derailed from the Panthers a little bit there. <laughs> a little bit, but like we finished my list. So. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. So now we can talk about whatever. Um, but no, I, the Quinn Hughes thing, like watching it, like I knew it was coming, but it still kind of hurt my heart, especially because it was so close. It was only like 200 points. Oh, so close. So close. And like, like the Sean Couturier one was a blowout. And I was like, we're cool. The- I'm I'm just glad that like and in fairness the Selkie even Couturier this year won it partially on reputation the the Selkie is a reputation based award not a merit based award it just so happens that Couturier also deserved it on merit this year yeah I mean like when Bergeron was on the list I was like fuck he's gonna lose it again right like I wasn't when scared I, I of Ryan O'Reilly list, I was like are they really gonna friggin give this to Patrice Bergeron again wasn't, he wasn't, wasn't good this year he wasn't good defensively I mean he did put up like 100 points yeah but like I was like I wasn't scared of Ryan O'Reilly I saw Patrice Bergeron on the list I was like oh fuckers <laughs> but um or like the five people that didn't even vote for Sean Gattarier or seven like what the fuck like people, three of there them were people who didn't vote well i know uh three of them Don were Lechizion, Don yeah, Lechizion Don Lechizion actively like, didn't vote for him because he knew criteria was gonna win and he wanted yeah. to spotlight some other players but like fuck you dom like <laughs> and then there were like three pittsburgh people and like yeah that makes sense <laughs> and i think greg washinsky didn't vote for him either which really is like, I, i've been meaning to actually like, not, look over the ballots i'm not I want positive to see. on that not God, or no Crosby he voted, sucked defensively this year yeah or no he voted for him third, which I was like. Last year, Crosby should have won the, the Selkie, but. No. Last year, Crosby was phenomenal defensively. Yeah. But I also, like, I now have a, like, rightful feud with the Calder Trophy. Like, before it was just the Shane Goss's Bear thing, and I'm like, I don't think this is a feud. Now the Kale McCarr thing, I'm like, this is a full-on feud. <laughs> <laughs> I can feud. The Calder Trophy is an enemy of the pod. I, I feel like Miro Haskinen should retroactively get the Calder Trophy for his rookie year. Just over, like now, because he's so good. Over Elias Pettersson? No. Over Pettersson. Not over Pettersson. No. I'm definitely falling victim to recency bias. But yeah. <laughs> I Pedersen love was Miro so Haskin. good last. Pettersson was so good last year. Like, he really so was. So dominating. And, like, he carried the Vancouver Canucks on his back. Like, the Sedins were gone. All the pressure was on him. And yeah. he was like, fuck it, let's go. Like... I just love what Haskinen is doing now. Like, and I know that doesn't mean that he should win the Calder yeah. retroactively. It's so fun to watch because <laughs> they put Jamie Oleksiak with him. And Jamie Oleksiak has like grown up since leaving. Like, getting traded to the Pittsburgh Penguins was the best thing to happen to Jamie Oleksiak yeah. because Jamie Oleksiak had to learn to actually play defense, which he didn't have to do when he was with the Stars the first time around. And because he was like their young first round pick. The Penguins were like, you don't mean shit to us. Learn how to goddamn play defense. And so when he went back to the Stars, he had that skill. And so Haskinen can just go out there and be Haskinen and not worry about getting pinched or, like, losing it because he knows that Jamie Alaxiak is six foot nine, going to outrun anybody and can make up for his mistakes behind him. And right. that freedom is so amazing. And you kind of see it with Ivan Provorov on the Flyers when they put Matt Niskin in there because he doesn't have to be the responsible one. And because, like, when he was playing with Shane Goss's bear, you kind of lost that Ivan Provorov, Provorov-ishness because he had to make up for Shane Goss's bear. And I love, right. Shane, I love Shane Goss's bear. Like, he's a Florida guy. My grandmother mm-hmm. thinks he's Jewish. 
He's not, but my grandmother has made him an honor- honorary. Not everyone who grew up playing in Pines Ice Arena is Jewish. Like that's. Well, she's like he's. She's like he's from South Florida, and his nose. He's got to be, and I'm like no. <laughs> no. I'd, I'm no I'd, I'd focus more on the eyebrows than the nose. Gossip <laughs> Bear's Gossip Bear's got some Jewish eyebrows. I know, but like I'm like grandma, like that's anti-Semitic. I feel like I need to clarify on the podcast that I am Jewish. Like otherwise, yeah. <laughs> a lot of the things I'm saying start sounding really weird. <laughs> but I'm like, but like. I love Shane Gosses Bear, but like playing with Ivan Provorov handcuffs Ivan Provorov, and you do not want to handcuff Ivan Provorov. And so, if the Panthers could find a way to get rid of Keith Yandel and bring in Shane Gosses Bear to replace him, I would be so happy. That's, you mentioned the defensive pairing earlier. Like, why would you not want Jacob Chikrin and Shane? Because I, I kind of forgot about them for a split second. Like for some reason, Andrew Peak and Chase Prisky were the ones who came to mind. Also, you got to be thinking. Luke Hughes, Hughes next year. He's need- not from Florida though. He was not born in Florida. Oh, he was. His family had moved out of Florida by the time by the time Luke was born. So I don't uh, care about him. Other than that, he's Jewish. I mean, rude. Luke is the third best Hughes behind Quinn. <laughs> it, the power rankings are Ellen Weinberg Hughes, yeah. Quinn Hughes, um, Luke, any dog they have, Jim Jack. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> No, Jack Hughes holds a special place in my heart just for being the first Jew to ever go first overall. I mean, when he grows his mullet, he will bounce over his father. But flash me your titties hanging out with Dixie D'Amelio, Jack so Hughes ridiculous. is pretty low on my list. Like, yeah. I love him. He's my child. But you're like, oh, my kid's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> he is quite literally the middle child. Like. Yeah. Somebody made a uh, thread of like the Hughes's best moments, and so many of them are Luke. I'm like, oh, you're so dumb. I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite thing right now is that picture of them playing basketball. That Jack, like yeah. Jack, is good for one thing, and it's posting amazing pictures of his brothers. And so <laughs> there's that picture of them, and they're lined up like singular. Like Luke is like six inches taller than Quinn. Jack's exactly in the middle. And then you go on the NHL website, and it says they're all five <laughs> eleven. You're like, they're quite literally I not. love the NHL. <laughs> they're like, Quinn Hughes, Jack Hughes, Luke Hughes, all 5'11". Travis Konechny, 5'11". Mitch Marner, 5'11". You're, like, You're either 5'11 or 6'4". Like, that's how the NHL works. <laughs> they're, they're, or occasionally you get, like, Marty San Louis at 5'8". Like, that's, that's it. <laughs> like, you can't tell us that Johnny Goudreau is 5'11". <laughs> like, he's got to be 5'9". <laughs> like, we have eyes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Like, maybe in skates, but probably not. No. Skates Skates add three inches. Like, <laughs> not so, Well, if he's 5'9", then he's six foot on skates. No, they, but... they have him listed as 5'9". <laughs> that boy is not 5'9". Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then Kevin Hayes makes fun of Phil Myers for being, like, super tall and lanky. He's, like, he calls him a giraffe and all this thing. And then it's, like, one... Uh, interviewer is like, you know, you two are the same height, right? And Kevin is like, no, we're not. And he's like, no, you quite literally are the same height. <laughs> he's like, well, well, he's a he's a he's a leaf eater. <laughs> they the are both listed mean? at six foot five. Like, what the God, fuck does that mean, Kevin? I always forget how tall Kevin Hayes is until I look it up. Like, um, he he does not look like he should be six five. <laughs> the first thing I said to him, like, uh, like I'm crying. The first thing I said to Kevin was, wow, you are so big. <laughs> He's like, uh, thanks. And then I was like, showed him the weird sweatshirt. I made me laugh and we were cool. But I was like walking out to him because I'm five foot three. He's six foot five. I like, I'm in love with him. <laughs> the first thing I was like, wow, you are so big. And if you know me, you know that I like them dumb and huge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, this is not okay. Like, I can't fall more in love with you. <laughs> it's just like... He doesn't look like he should be that tall. He has like that squished little face, and like he he should be like five nine, five ten. Kevin Hayes, no, he's no. six five. Kevin Hayes should be like six two. He has no business being six five. Right. <laughs> no. But but here we are. Good for that's, him. That's like um, there was a line at one point that was JVR, Kevin Hayes, and um, Travis Connect Me, and JVR is also like six five. And I'm like, is oh, he? they're taking their baby for a walk. <laughs> Is James Van Reems like that tall? He's also one of those yeah. players that JVR doesn't is seem... huge. God, he's, he's six. Huge. He's listed at six three. Yeah. yeah, JVR is ginormous, and JVR isn't just tall. Like Kevin Hayes is tall, but he's like kind of narrow. Same with Will Myers. JVR is just broad. Okay, this is this is the thing that really messes me up. 
um this this is this is something i would never expect just by like thinking about it but it is apparently true james van reenstijk is taller than trevor van reenstijk yeah i don't like that (laughs) That, maybe it's because in my brain like the defenseman should be taller than the forward but james van reenstijk is an inch taller than his brother trevor (laughs) you know what my favorite like weird size stat is like you know how they're like women are too small to play in the nhl like blah 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 Claude Giroux and Hillary Knight are the exact same height. I was going to say, isn't Hillary Knight like six foot? Like, yeah. Well, okay. yeah. Hillary Knight and Claude Giroux yeah. are the exact same height and weight. Like, <laughs> ridiculous. Or like, okay, some, I was talking to a guy earlier and he was like, I have like a weird icebreaker on Bumble. <laughs> Matt, it's like, if you could fight anybody in the world and if you win, you switch lives, who would it be? Like, you have to win. To, and you switch lives. And so mine is Jeff Bezos because he's like 5'2", 80 pounds. I could break him. Really? Yes. Okay, then <laughs> I retract everything I've ever said about J.K. Simmons playing Jeff Bezos in his biopic because yes. Jeff Be- or J- J.K. Simmons is much taller than that. No, Jeff Bezos is tiny. I think he's like 5'6". But anyway, I he could... He is 5'7". Yeah, I could break him. According so, to Google. Yeah, not scared of fighting Jeff Bezos. <laughs> Apparently, he's 5'7", 154. I could break him. God, I would also <laughs> choose Jeff Bezos. Yeah. I could kick his ass. <laughs> <laughs> like, I could win that fight. But anyway, so he was like, he's like, I would take my chances on Lionel Messi because if I do win, I would be the best soccer player in the world. I'm like, well, A, that's false. And he's like, what, Cristiano Ronaldo? I was like, um, no, Alex Morgan or Abby Wambach. Like, straight up. Like, Abby Wambach's not the best player anymore. Christine well, yeah, she, she, <laughs> she did retire. So it's like Alex Morgan. So it's like- Alex Morgan. Yeah, I'm like, um, false. <laughs> also, I feel like soccer players would kick your ass. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't care how, how short a soccer player is. They are agile. This kid is five foot nine and Jewish. You're not beating Lionel Messi in a fight. Yeah, that, that Leo Messi will dodge everything you try to do and then will, like, trip you up and stomp you out. Like, I'm yeah. that's... <laughs> like, you're not beating a professional athlete in a fight. Like, <laughs> you go with out-of-shape billionaires. I was like, one guy said Mark Zuckerberg, and I was like, that's dumb. He learned karate. (laughs) (laughs) I hate, like, I mean, like, yes, I would love to fight Mark Zuckerberg, but he would kick my ass. (laughs) Jeff Bezos is the right answer. I didn't realize how little he was. Yeah. Like, give away all of his money, and then you still have generational wealth. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Like, good. Although, I wonder, Warren Buffett's a little taller, but he's also, well, I don't want to trade lives with a 90-year-old, though. Because then I wouldn't get to enjoy it for very long. The most interesting man in the world is based off of Warren Buffett. So, like, you don't know what he knows. That's true. I didn't know that. I didn't know that the most interesting man in the world was based off Warren Buffett. Yeah. Also, I have no real reason to, like, dislike Warren Buffett other than the general, like, all billionaires are unethical. Yeah. But, like, he got his in finance. So, like, if he didn't get caught in the 2008 shit, I have no reason to dislike Warren Buffett because, like, they all got audited then. True. I mean, Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg are, like, actively evil. Also, Warren Buffett lives in Omaha. And, like, who wants to live? Who wants to be 90 years old in friggin' Omaha, Nebraska? You know like, how, but, like, no, you don't have to be 90. You just trade lives. Like, you're still you. Oh. Yeah. So like, Oh, interesting. So you'd be 25, I'm guessing? Seven. Seven. <laughs> Um, you look great. Thank You'd you. be 27. <laughs> this is, for the record, this is the first time in like ever that anyone has guessed younger. <laughs> I usually get older, but now I'm getting to that point well, no, where so I here's look the thing how old that, people have thought I am. Well, so here's the thing is that I know you're Jewish and I know that Judaism ages us. And so I'm like, take it back. Um, like our people have suffered and now we have bags under our eyes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Megan's so uncomfortable. <laughs> I was like, can I laugh? I don't know. Yes. Uh, you can, if we can make the jokes and you can laugh, you can't right. make the jokes. You are currently Jewish adjacent, so you're allowed to laugh. Um, you cannot make the jokes. Bingo. Um, <laughs> but I'm like, I, you, but like you still, you have to stay in Omaha. But you have that. No, kind of I, I wouldn't want Warren Buffett's life if it meant I had, if it meant I had to stay in friggin' Nebraska. I don't want to But like the cost Nebraska. of living in Nebraska is so low. I know, but. If I'm going to switch lives, if I'm going to beat the crap out of a billionaire and, tr- and get his life, I'm going to choose the one that lives in Seattle, not the one that lives in Omaha. True. Uh, or like, 
no, Grimes could beat me in a fight. And then I would, <laughs> it's like the first, like, like I would, would you want to be married to Jeff no, Bezos? I would, like, ugh. I would divorce Elon Musk. Uh, oh, half right. Elon Musk. Money, that's what I meant. <laughs> Duh. Take half his money, expose him for all his weirdness, and then own SpaceX. True. Because that's but what I, I would want. For some reason, I feel like Elon Musk, you would lose in a fight, though, also. Yeah. 6'2. I wouldn't want to deal with that. He probably knows. No, Grimes. Something. I'm fighting Grimes, but I feel yeah, like Yeah, I'm just trying to think of the other would, like, side bring, of it. She like, would bring a knife. So, like, I'd be done. <laughs> Wait, yeah, hold on. What are the stipulations of this fight? Is it is it like it's a one-on-one -on -one fist fight? Or it's is, like cage yeah. match, MMA, UFC style fists. Like, so then Grimes isn't allowed to use that knife. But she would bring it. Like, she would carve her, like, fingernail into a shiv. But, like, she didn't even carve it. It just already was that way. Yeah, that's just how it grows naturally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, anybody who, like, names their baby AEX-12 is not playing with a full deck. <laughs> well, I still want to know how that's supposed to be pronounced. Uh, Asia. Asia. Yeah. No. No, it isn't. <laughs> Where's the uh? It's not in the 12. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. Man. That's the only time I ever watched anything from Joe Rogan was when it was, like, Elon Musk teaches you how to say the baby's name, and I was like, click. And I, was like, I was like, I hate all of these people, but I need to know. That's like, have I, yeah. you ever? Thank you, thank you for informing me, because I wanted to know. No I problem. was never curious enough to seek it out. Have you, have, did you ever watch Happy Endings? Uh, no, it, I don't think so. It was like ABC's like Modern Friends. It's so good. It's so good. It got canceled after three seasons. But the Rachel character owns a store. Her name is Alex. The store is Alex backwards, XCLA. And then in the third season, she's like, my she's like i'm going to shayla and they're like what the fuck is shayla like it's my store and like there's a way to pronounce that <laughs> <laughs> like that's what i think of every time i see that baby's name yeah no I, that totally checks out <laughs> all right we've taken off enough of your time <laughs> we haven't talked about the panthers in like 20 minutes <laughs> so we're gonna let you go and we're gonna go do the rest of our show sounds great <laughs> well thank you so much for having me on all right